Bib Forbes is the most productive Aust Australian free market advocate for each of the past uh, 36 years. <laughs> At uh, www.bibforbes.info, um, I, I, I have uh, I have seen like just how just how great he, he really is, <laughs> um, and um, and I'm, I'm tr truly inspired by him. Um, in, in my own inferior way, I am, I am tr trying to start um, 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 my own thing with, with, with students mainly and, and, uh, and other groups um, on libertariansociety.info. And um, hopefully through that and my, my other ventures, we'll be able to continue in the spirit of the Workers' Party. Um, uh, without further ado, uh, Bib Forbes. Thank you very much, Samuel. We've heard a lot of very uh, erudite and learned papers here. I, uh, I feel a bit like the, one of the yapping dogs at the end of the Lord Mayor's procession. Uh, I, uh, I'm, I've studied some economics, but I'm not an economist. I've kept half the lawyers in Brisbane in, uh, in income, but I'm not a lawyer. I've, uh, been closely involved in the political process, but I'm not a politician. Uh, and uh, I'm largely, largely been uh, an agitator. I started off as a, uh, an accidental agitator, and then I became a serial agitator. <laughs> and I tell you, I didn't always look like this. Uh, I used to have jet black hair and a big Ned Kelly, red beard. That's what uh, 36 years of uh, agitation in the political process does to you. <laughs> when uh, Benjamin invited me to speak to this uh, uh, function, I said uh, I was a very reluctant starter because uh, I've addressed so many uh, cold, rough, dust, dusty rooms on subjects in which I spent hours and hours of preparation that I said that's not a, uh, a worthwhile transaction any longer. I'm, I'm giving, giving up uh, speaking to people. I'll write from here on, but he convinced me to come along and I said, okay, long as uh, you accept that I will just chatter on what I feel like and uh, stop when I run out. And so there may be no question time or 10 minutes of question time. Everybody is a product of their character, circumstance and chance. And uh, probably most of us are moulded by our history. I was born in a long time back, 1939. Just at the time the tanks rolled into Poland. I don't remember any of that period, but I do remember the period immediately afterwards. And the 10 years after the Great War sowed the seeds <coughs> to many of the things that we're reaping today. And uh, I guess my attitude to politics and my attitude to economics tended to be sowed from those days. We were dairy farmers. I heard my father talking about Chifley, who wanted to nationalise the banks. And uh, my father cursed them, so I was against nationalisation. I was also against Chifley. I heard uh, my father talking about the strikes in the coal mines. The power stations were going to run out of coal. Chifley brought the troops and put the troops into the coal mines. I heard about Fred Patterson, <coughs> who was elected to the Queensland Parliament, the first communist elected to Parliament, I think, anywhere in the world in a free election. He was supported by the meat workers in Bowen, the coal, coke work operators in Bowen, and the coal miners in Collinsville. Just a little story on, and I was only a, a young child then, and but I. 
I got, gathered these impressions and those impressions coloured my life as it probably colours all of yours. Just one little story about it. I, I was a bit of a loner as a kid. I was an orphan and uh, adopted into another family with no children my age. My best friend was an old blue cattle dog. His name was Digger. And uh, I loved Digger so much that I thought he should have a more uh, bigger name than Digger. He needed a surname as well. So a Digger is something like a miner, so he became Digger Miner. And then as I sat uh, dreaming, as I helped my father milk the cows, I thought, well, he deserves a bigger name than that also. Eventually, Digger ended up with four names. He was Digger, Striker, Communist, Miner. <laughs> Those were all the associated words I had in my very young mind. Such are the ways that <coughs> philosophies and uh, beliefs develop. The, uh, the few years the, the, up to 1950 were very tumultuous years. We still had petrol rationing in Australia. Uh, communists See, the, the uh, free societies all came home tired. All they wanted to do was get back to the farms, get back to their homes, get married, have kids, which they proceeded to do. But the communists were more dedicated than that, as always they're, they're more dedicated than us. But we tend to have more useful, interesting, important things to do. They only have ideology. In that few years between, mainly in 1948, but in those years around the uh, late 40s, the uh, Labor government nationalised railways and steel in Britain. The Workers' Party was formed. Who knew that? The Workers' Party was formed in North Korea. <laughs> The communists took over Czechoslovakia. They went close to taking over Poland. They took over North Korea. They were agitating in Indonesia, China, Vietnam, Czechoslovakia, Malaya, Hungary. It appeared as if very soon, from the Rhine to the South China Sea, the world would be communist. That's in our history. Those people never gave up. Luckily, uh, the years, uh, the 50s came along then, and uh, suddenly uh, things changed. The 50s and the 60s were the years of boom years. Uh, I, I was, I think I've lived the luckiest generation in Australia. I missed the war. I missed the depressions. I missed the Korean War even. Never had a depression. I left university, I could pick any job I chose. I never looked for a job in my life. In the 50s, it was the, the years of booms and babies. The headlines of the day were, oil struck at Mooney, oil at Barrow Island, uranium at Mary Kathleen, the iron ore in the west, coal in central Queensland, and they were headlines that everybody rejoiced. Geoffrey Blaney described those years as the rush that never ended, but the rush is going to end. The boom years ended with Whitlam in 1972. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the, uh, the baby boom, which followed me, was the most selfish, the most pampered, the most ignorant, uh, the laziest generation Australia has ever produced. <laughs> and the results of that generation produced the Whitlam era. They all got jobs as sociologists, uh, <laughs> economists, lecturers, journalists, uh, the overheads, they became the overhead looking for an income and 
Unfortunately, I was spending my time in with dirty hands in the industries providing the income, like farming and mining. The, uh, we are here, and I've heard lots of very learned discussions about the fairly abstruse things and big words that I've never heard of, and they're all very important. But the future is determined by those people out there. I guess that's why, I'm sorry, uh, as the years go by, I find I'm fairly emotional about some things, so you just have to forgive that. I guess that's part of the reason I've continued. I decided to join the Liberal Party because I reckoned I've got to do something about all these things. It was a, an eye-opening experience for me. I was a, at that stage, I believed the philosophies meant something. And, uh, and I uh, thought you needed to believe in something to be in a political party. I went to the very first meeting after I joined the Liberal Party and I met the chairman. It happened to be the, the uh, night of the annual general meeting of that branch. And this was in the branch of uh, uh, St Lucia in the most blue ribbon seat in the Liberal Party in Queensland at the time. And after a little bit of discussion, the chairman said to me, uh, we're having elections tonight, would you like to be secretary of the party? Of the branch, I mean. And I would have loved to have been secretary of the branch. I thought that was on the stepping stone to political power and uh, that's where I was wanting to head. But I was so shocked that he had invited me to become what I saw as a useful and important official of the party. Little did I know how unimportant the position was, but. <laughs> and he knew nothing whatsoever about me, what I believed in, what I thought. So I turned him down. And, uh, and I never really regained faith in the Liberal Party after that. Very soon after that, uh, Jocelyn Maxwell sent me uh, a series of tapes, 20 tapes by Nathaniel Brandon called Principles of Objectivism. I'd never, I had no idea what the word objectivism meant and I'd never heard of Nathaniel Brandon and I didn't know who Ayn Rand was or any of all these people that have been discussed. But I listened to those tapes. I listened to them over and over again. I guess that's what converted me. Then I heard we were having this, uh, forming this new political party in Australia. And uh, you heard the story of that. I flew down and uh, got involved in the Workers' Party. Uh, after, I can't remember how long, maybe uh, 10 years of uh, valiant fighting in the Workers' Party, I think I stood as a <coughs> Senate leader a couple of times. And my wife stood as a candidate, and all my friends stood as candidates, and uh, the world passed us by. I became a, a very good business friend of mine, uh, said to me one time, we were having a meeting about how we were going, and he said, Viv, and he was a, a marketing man, and he said, Viv, we're trying to sell cornflakes in a black and white box label, labelled dog turd. <laughs> and he said, we're never going to sell it. And he was right. So at that moment, I decided we needed a better box and a better name. So I then initiated the formation of the Progress Party, which had exactly the same principles as the Workers' Party, but it talked a bit more about uh, the way we might get there and uh, the, f the policies rather than just in your face, the ABC's no good, we'll sell it tomorrow. And all this other stuff has got to go next week. Uh, it was a bit more gradualist. Oh, we were very successful too, initially. Our very first election was uh, in the Northern Territory. We ran in every seat in the Northern Territory. We got 13% of the vote right across the electorate. We thought that was pretty good. But like the Workers' Party, it was all downhill from then on. I then became a, a serial ad agitator in 
almost e every way. I, uh, I founded the Foundation for Economic Education in Australia with permission of Leonard Reed. For years I distributed the Freeman magazine, a beautiful <coughs> little magazine. I've got hundreds of them still in my shed if anybody wants some. I set up the uh, Council for the Competitive Economy. That didn't last very long because I found nobody wanted a competitive economy. <laughs> the consumers didn't understand it. The businessmen wanted it for all those other people but not for us. So that didn't last long at all. I then set up the Taxpayers United, which was much more uh, effective and long-lasting because a lot of people were taxpayers. Even some of those who were net consumers of tax still felt as if they were taxpayers. So uh, <laughs> uh, I set up the Council of Resources and Energy, uh, whose uh, who's a very aggressive program was to just have a sensible policy for uh, mining, selling and, ex and, and using uranium in Australia. That was a fairly unpopular program too, so that pro didn't last terribly long. I set up the Grassland Protection Society because I, uh, and I still feel very strongly that uh, the Greens in particular have this love affair with trees. Whereas if we had any sense at all, we'd have a love affair with grass. Because it's grass that feeds us, not trees. Anyhow, that wasn't a very popular program either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was even involved for a while in the Australian Defence Association. Uh, as I pointed out to people here last night, uh, I, w I tended to become the secretary of anything that I was involved in because there was no competition for that job and you could d direct it in the, and sometimes uh, not everybody in the organisation shared my philosophy and my aim was always to insinuate the ideas that you people are insinuating here today. But I decided that it had to be done out there in words that, like they talk about. I've, uh, I've written lots, but I've had nothing published in a learned economic journal. It's been published in the Baku Independent, or it was published in the Geelong Advertiser, or the Gladstone Observer. And it was only that long, it wasn't that long. But if it was that long, maybe they'll read it. And that's, uh, that's what I've been trying to do, is to, is to just sow little seeds of doubt one after another. The, um, the last of my great uh, crusades is the climate crusade and it has undoubtedly been the most successful. Um, I guess because it's easier to explain to people what a scam it is and and there are a lot of people, particularly geologists, there are a lot of geologists supporting the, uh, my climate crusade because they've read a bit of geological history. They've read climate history. They know there is nothing new uh, about today's climate. There's nothing extreme, there's nothing new. The fluctuations are very minor, the temperature is very moderate, and even if it warms up a bit, we'll probably benefit. There were others uh, fighting this battle before I took it up, uh, Ray Evans in particular at the Lavisia Society. Ray and I have been allies for a long time in various things, but I, uh, I saw that he was, uh, he was fighting the Carbon Crusade, but I didn't uh, join. Until, it's amazing how little things just motivate you into action. I uh, went to a meeting of the National Pollution Inventory Committee, who was telling us in the mining industry what uh, we were going to have to report to the government every six months about what terrible polluting things we were doing. And they listed all the pollutants and they were listing all the ways and how we were going to have to report all this stuff. And one of the pollutants listed was carbon dioxide. And that really hit me like a sledgehammer. I'm a farmer, I'm a soil scientist. 
I understand the carbon cycle. I could not believe that even someone so stupid as those in the Department of Climate Change could consider carbon dioxide a pollutant by any stretch of anyone's imagination. I decided then and there that I was going to have to expose this stupid scam. I hadn't looked into, like the, the Workers' Party, I fell into it and learned later what it was all about. I fell into this climate crusade and then learned what it was all about. And the more I learned, the more shallow the whole thing is. There is no basis for what almost any of the claims being made. Except it is true that mankind is affecting the environment. All you've got to do is look out there. That, that used to be scrub or, or something else. So obviously we're affecting the environment. We're putting things into the air and into the water. We're not controlling the climate and the carbon dioxide is certainly not one of the things we need to be concerned about. Uh, since uh, uh, I've uh, got involved in this uh, carbon crusade, it, it, there is a large coalition. In the, in the Workers' Party days, in the Progress Party days, we were totally alone. We had lots of secret uh, supporters. A good friend of mine was very prominent in the Liberal Party, in fact, one of, our, uh, one of our founders became, and it still is, very uh, uh, prominent in the Liberal National Party. But he uh, said to me, Viv, I'm glad you're out there. You make us sound quite moderate. <laughs> and that is a useful role to play in society. The same with what you people have been saying here about banking and uh, central banking and uh, economic uh, policies. You can make us uh, promoters of policy change sound much more moderate. There are common features in all of these uh, battles I've been involved in, in all sorts of industries. They're all the same features. On the other side, the same philosophies. In many cases, the same people, the same organisations. They are the centralists the people who want more power, the people who want, they want to abolish all other sources of power or influence. They want to abolish local authorities and replace them with regional authorities. They want to abolish state governments and any sort of federal system. They want to abolish upper houses. They want to even remove most of the power from national governments. They don't want anybody to be able to upset, call into question, or heaven forbid, vote on any of the things that they are aiming at. They want to abolish private property and they want to confiscate guns. They're all the same people, the same organisations. They all promote the myth of centralised organisation. A lot of people get excited and Neville keeps uh, trying to draw me into an, a discussion about anarchy versus limited government. Never excites me. I'm quite happy to ally myself with any anarchist. I'm a bit like Churchill who when Stalin ended the war and Churchill was the most famed anti-communist in the world, he said, if the devil himself marched against Hitler, I would at least give him a favourable mention in Parliament. I feel the same thing. I'm quite happy to accept any ally. Uh, I'll be a fellow traveller with the anarchists until we reach limited government, and then we'll decide where we go from there. Um, so I very much appreciate uh, that you're out there. You make us limited government people seem quite reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> Never before have I felt reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the other thing that I've learned is uh, we live in a democracy and a democracy is about counting votes. It's not about winning minds with brilliant arguments. It's about 
sowing, largely about sowing doubts. So I try to use every technique to sow little seeds of doubt about this gargantuan state apparatus. We can all use principled arguments if we want to, or we can use utilitarian arguments. The principal arguments say, government shouldn't be doing this, therefore that should stop. And that's true. But I will say, if government does that, it's going to result in this sort of long-term result. The unintended, unintended consequences are going to be very costly, and therefore this is not a good idea. And some people will say, hmm, yeah, I thought it was a good idea, but maybe it's not such a good idea. So uh, we've got to use every argument. Uh, we need the people putting the philosophy and the legal basis, but we need the people, the re retailers of second-hand ideas. That's basically what I've done all my life. I've never been the leader of the ideas, but I can retail the ideas. So we've got to use stories. Christ used parables. He told stories. He started with just 12. It caught on fairly well. And he used stories. Pictures, cartoons. I keep trying to find cartoonists who will make fun of all this. But nothing can stand being laughed at. So, uh, Peter, wherever you are, limericks. Write more limericks. Draw more pictures. Tell more stories, more jokes more picturesque stories about the terrible consequences of where we're going. Demonstrations. Uh, sometimes I've used all sorts of organisations to achieve. Sometimes I even use non diplomas So if you ever see anything written by Richard Sebroff, that's me. <laughs> uh, I wrote a whole series of articles for Business Queensland in Queensland, and because I was fairly prominent in my my uh, professional career, I thought I'd better not spoil it. So they were all written by Richard Watkins. Um, my real name was Watt, and Richard is my second name. Richard Sebroff is Richard is my second name, and Sebroff is Forbes backwards. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I read an article one time and I wanted to make this uh, what I thought was fairly brilliant quote and I thought nobody will take any notice of this if I say it. So I quoted Richard Sebroff. <laughs> <laughs> and about four years later I saw Michael Cobb in the uh, federal parliament quoting Richard Sebroff. <laughs> So it, it really makes me feel good to see all of you uh, young people here. Us old fellows like Ron and Neville and I and a few others, we'll fire a few more shots. But very soon the baton will be in your hands. So good luck in that fight. We, uh, we don't know where it will all end and it will never end. It's a continual battle. Since the days of Aristotle, the same battle has been waged. We just managed to move things back a little. And they push back a little, and we push back a little. So just keep up the battles. It's a big, long war, but we just try to win a few battles. Thanks. I personally have literally hundreds of questions for Viv Forbes, and I, I'm sure you, you do. Two questions I have, and there's no time for questions now, but just, just to give you the taste of what I'll ask him to write up later is his relationship with Bert Kelly, who is Australia's Ron Paul, and his relationship with Lang Hancock. These are two of the most you know, impressive figures, even by international standards. and. Uh, he, he, I'm sure. I'm sure it's a long story about that, but, but we don't have time for that now.